All right, well, good evening. My name is Chris Bronlick, and I'm president of the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy. Our namesake once wrote, to compel a man to furnish funds for the propagation of ideas he disbelieves and abhors is sinful and tyrannical. And maintaining the workplace freedom to prevent such compulsion is among the highest priorities of the Thomas Jefferson Institute. Last year, the General Assembly and Governor Northam approved a bill allowing local governments and school systems to sign monopoly union contracts with unions like the Service Employees International Union and the Virginia Education Association. Virginia governments and the citizens they represent have little or no experience with the notion of collective bargaining and to believe the union organizers now coming into Virginia the process is all unicorns and rainbows, as if everyone sits around the campfire singing Kumbaya. As a former Civil Service Employee Association member in New York and the son and grandson of Carpenters Union members, I can assure you it doesn't work like that. That's why we're proud to offer this webinar tonight with a seasoned policy labor, labor policy attorney and an important practitioner of negotiation who spent most of his career negotiating for the union side on this issue. F. Vincent Vernuccio is a visiting fellow with the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy. He brings over a decade of experience in labor law and policy. He's regarded as one of the leading experts in the field. As a labor policy consultant, he's advised a multitude of policy and grassroots organizations throughout the country, served as special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Labor, in the George W. Bush administration, as a member of the labor transition team for the Trump administration, and as a member of the Federal Service Impasses panel. He's well-respected, sought-after voice on labor policy panels throughout the country and in Washington, D.C., and he's advised scores of congressmen and state legislators on labor-related issues. Frank Ritchie retired as a battalion chief and union president for the New Haven Firefighters in which capacity he regularly negotiated the firefighter's contract with the city. Awarded numerous commendations, including the Medal of Valor, Mr. Ritchie now serves on the advisory board for Fire Engineering Magazine. He was the lead plaintiff in the landmark Supreme Court case, Ritchie versus DiStefano, and has testified before Congress on that same subject. He's lectured at the Reagan Library. He's been a lead consultant on several studies for the Yale School of Medicine, and has appeared on Hannity, Lou Dobbs, Cavuto, Hardball, NBC Nightly News, and other new notable news shows. He now serves as Yankee Institute's Fellow for Labor and Special Initiatives. Mr. Venuccio, let's start with you. Virginia's collective bargaining law makes, makes the issue a local option. Localities can choose to have public employee collective bargaining, or they can refuse to, to allow it. Union officials are saying collective bargaining will be collaborative. Now, you've studied labor law and collective bargaining agreements all over the country, and you've read, I think, all of the ordinance approved, ordinances approved or currently under consideration in Alexandria, Loudoun, and Fairfax. What are you seeing in those ordinances? Is it really collaborative, or are you seeing any of the same clauses and the loss of worker protections you've seen in the big city union contracts? Oh, there is um, a, a lot of overlap with the contracts that we've seen in uh, Connecticut, as Frank will probably talk about, New York, Illinois, uh, California. But first, Chris, thank you so much to you and the Thomas Jefferson Institute for hosting this and allowing me the time to speak. And Frank, it is an honor to speak alongside you. And I know everyone is really excited to hear from your experience and what happens in the real world uh, when it comes to un government union negotiations. Chris, going back to your question, no, it is uh, not going to be a collaborative uh, process. Uh, by its nature, collective bargaining is adversarial. It's both sides trying to extract as much as they can from the other side. And what we've seen from unions around the country is that they encourage that adversarial relationship because they have to prove their worth to their membership and they have to say we're fighting for you and unfortunately that comes at the cost of workplace harmony and you're seeing a lot of things being set up in some of these both proposed and passed ordinances and of course we've seen in northern virginia um, many uh many areas are starting to consider it um, this unfortunately has been passed in Ale the city of alexandria 
in Arlington. Uh, Fairfax was uh, debating it very recently um, and some others. And uh, what I notice most about those is the lopsidedness of the ordinance proposals for union rights and union privileges and employee rights. Um, you know, perfect example is that in order in one proposed ordinance, in order to form a union, it takes simply a majority of those voting. But then to remove it, they have to jump through all of these different hoops and time uh, time frames, and it's a very narrow window. But then it's a majority of everybody in the entire bargaining unit to decertify. So it's the lopsidedness. And there's also provisions that will trap public employees into paying unions. And, you know, we could go on and on and on. But yeah, looking at the ordinances to answer your question, especially the models that have been coming down the pike, um, it is definitely setting the stage for not just that adversarial relationship between, um, you know, unions and, their, and the employer, or the city or the county, but really unions and employees that don't want to be union members and don't want that representation. And unfortunately, they will be forced to accept that representation, whether they want it or not. One of my favorite clauses is one you refer to as the Hotel California clause. <laughs> the Hotel, yes, it's um, very easy to form a union, but once the union's in, it is um, nearly impossible to decertify. Essentially, you have you know, 30, you days, yeah, 30 days before the end of the contract. Um, and in some cases, if you miss that window, even if the contracts expire, I've seen one proposal that you're out of luck and you can do nothing to decertify the union. And of course, to certify the union, uh, you have a lot of professional organizers coming in and assisting. But to um, say, no, we want to go with somebody else. We don't like this union. It is an incredibly difficult uphill battle. And, and I've seen this around the country of uh, employees not get, not being able to end the union representing them, even if most employees don't want that representation. Mr. Ritchie, what about you? Is it, it, Have you seen collaboration in, in practice? You're the, you're the one that's been the practitioner of this. Uh, does it create greater workplace harmony? Chris, on uh, behalf of Yankee Institute and our president, Carol platt Lebow, I'd like to just thank you. It's an honor to be here for this webinar with Vinny and yourself. Um, harmony really isn't what it's about. Um, kind of we go back to the, the scorpion and the frog. Vinny talked about the very nature. Some people say that politics is war without the bloodshed. I always say collective bargaining is like hand-to-hand -hand combat without the assault charges. It's very personal, it's very dirty, and that's what the union is supposed to do by law. That's set by labor law. They're doing exactly what they're intended to do. They're advocating for their best position that they can get, but here's the thing, by any lawful means. So the unions have a saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So if they can't get at the table when they're bargaining, they get at the table by going the end run politically or through the press. So for elected leaders to understand how unions operate, they have to understand a little bit about collective bargaining. You talked about briefly how you came from a union family. A lot of people don't come from union families because they've been diminishing in the private sector. So now we have you become an elected leader, no fault of their own, but they have very little experience. And they think when they vote on a contract that they're really the up and down vote. By putting forth a collective bargaining agreement, those elected officials are actually abrogating their authority to unelected bureaucrats. And I don't even say that as a negative way. Sometimes they're really great people, human resources director, the labor director, because the collective bargaining agreement isn't just something that occurs every four years. The collective bargaining agreement is a work in progress every day, and there will be charges, and there will be grievances, and municipal prohibited practices, and somebody's going to decide how to settle those things. And a lot of times, the elected officials look at a settlement, and they're like, wait a second, I didn't vote for that. No, you voted for the collective bargaining agreement, so therefore, you're giving the power to a bureaucrat. The other thing to keep in mind is if you pick up any union contract and you take a look at it, you're going to find a section right in the beginning called management rights. It's usually about this big. Most collective bargaining agreements in America are somewhere between 40 and 70 pages. 
Everything else that you read in that contract, besides that one paragraph, basically handcuffs management. It, it handcuffs management to make those key decisions to have discretion on how to manage the workforce. So every paragraph after that first one basically abridges or modifies and takes away management's rights. So it's not friendly, no unicorns um, at the bargaining table. Well, let me ask, in the, in the past, you, you've you talked a little bit about unions, quote, creating a problem to get something they want. Uh, what kind of problems are we talking about here? As I said, any problem that is created lawfully, they will do. I'm going to give you a perfect example that's been in the news. So in Connecticut, the governor before the pandemic allowed employees to state employees to work from home 50% of the time. When the pandemic happened, the governor said 100% of the time you can work from home. So governor's being reasonable. He's trying to protect workers at that time. We didn't understand all the science. So lo and behold, magically, the governor says, wait a second, we need to operate the state. We need to get our workers back to work. And this is recently. So he said, okay, workers, you got to come back to work 50% of the time. What did the union do? The union sued the governor. They filed an injunction. And here's the important thing to realize. The union knew that they weren't going to win an injunction. Uh, injunctions are hard fought and not easily won. You have to prove irreputable harm. Where's the irreputable harm about going to work? You have to prove that you'll also win on the likelihood of the merits of the case. The union wasn't going to beat the governor. But what they did by the injunction was, it wasn't about suing the government to, governor to get to the end. They sued the governor so the governor would rush to the bargaining table, negotiate against himself, and they would get more for nothing. And then what do we have the governor do? He comes out and claims victory. We settled the suit, but the unions grabbed more power. Now they can stay home up to 80% of the time. They can petition to stay home 100% of the time. They got more power by creating a problem which was a non-issue that they never would have won. And they do this all the time. They're very transactional and elected officials fall for it. Managers fall for it. They're, the unions are playing chess and management is generally playing checkers. I, I remember when uh, when COVID first hit, you, you had a situation where Stu, we were very upset in Virginia because schools were closing and, and kids were, were going to be taught from home and teachers were doing this online and it was very uneven and unsteady. And I remember reading in California where literally the union teachers would not do online instruction because it was not part of their union contract. And it took those school systems three, four months before they came to an agreement on how to do that. And, and that, that just strikes me as the kind of thing where, where the priority is the union, not the students and not the kids. Um, folks, I just wanna remind you that if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the uh, chat room or raise your hand. And we'll try to get to them at, at the end of all this. Vinny, let me ask you, there, are there, I'm, I'm intrigued by this whole issue of, of worker rights and worker protections. Are, are there any other state laws that impact collective bargaining and in, in particular would, would protect workplace freedom? Thankfully, there are. Um, and I'll, I'll list a couple of them. And some of them, I think the early versions of some of the collective bargaining ordinances ignored, but um, I think they begrudgingly are starting to put them in. And the first and foremost is the right to a secret ballot. So Virginia, about a decade ago, passed the Secret Ballot Protection Act, um, especially for union elections. So if the state is going to allow a union to, um, to form and the union gets enough cards signed, then there has to be an election. There has to be a secret ballot election. And that's the one thing that everyone has to remember. It's, you know, even if a county or a town or a city passes one of these ordinances, it's not just up to the elected officials, it's the public employees that get to vote. And according to Virginia law, they vote in a secret ballot election. But, and now here's where they're trying to start to get around it. Um, some of the ordinances are getting a little loose with what secret ballot means. Um, so for instance, they may try to allow for electronic card signing um, or mail-in voting. Um, and you know we're seeing at the federal level, 
that there's already a lot of headaches and a lot of problems with these issues. But um, you know, we'll see what happens. But the bottom line is employees are entitled to a secret ballot. The other thing that um, thankfully in Virginia specifically, but now across the entire country that public employees are entitled to um, is the ability to choose whether or not to pay the union. And that comes first from Virginia's Right to Work Act, which um, is uh, something that unfortunately is now being debated yet again um, after working for, well, almost three quarters of a century. Um, but that and the recent Supreme Court decision, Janus versus AFSCME. And what Janus said is that everything that government unions do mm -hmm. is political. And because of that political nature, public employees across the country have a First Amendment right to choose whether or not to pay union dues or not. So um, public employees in Virginia, even if an ordinance passes, even if they're organized by a union, they still will have that choice whether or not to pay union dues and unions can't get them fired for not payment as they can for private sector employees in non-right to work states. Now, um, Janice actually went further and I, I haven't seen some of those protections within a lot of the ordinances. In fact, I've seen them go the other way. Um, and that is that um, the Justice Alito said that in order to have dues collected from an employee's paycheck, there has to be what the Supreme Court said, evidence of affirmative consent, or you know, shockingly, you have to show proof that someone wants money taken out of their paycheck and given to the union. Um, now, unfortunately, what we're seeing with a lot of these ordinances is they're saying that an employee can actually give that consent over the phone without a disclaimer, and then they're bound to it for a year. So unfortunately, while they are protected in choosing whether to pay, they can actually be trapped or tricked into payment because of a lot of these clauses. So it's another thing that unfortunately we're watching out for. Or, or even if they made a mistake, I mean, you, if you, push the wrong button on a subscription, you're, you're able to cancel almost immediately in every other consumer law. This is the one, one area I know of where, where consumers aren't protected. You're stuck once you're in. Um, well, the ordinances are specific. I mean, somebody could say, hey, you want, you, know, you, you want to be part of the union? I go, yeah, that's it. That's enough evidence. And then um, you're trapped in for up to a year, according to one of the, those ordinances. Hmm. Chief Ritchie, let me ask you, you were a battalion chief and, and union negotiator. This is a, a tough time of year for, for firefighters and, and police and firefighters are, are looked at very differently by, by folks because you were first responders and because so many of us still remember uh, the events and the losses from 9-11. Here in Virginia, there are a lot of places where volunteer fire services uh, exist. Uh, in some cases, I suspect they are the only thing that exists. But in other cases, uh, they, they are side by side. Here in Fairfax County, there are at least a half dozen volunteer fire stations, um, as well as the paid service. Now, I'm sure as a contributing editor to Fire Engineering, Mag Engineering Magazine, you've, you've occasionally seen some friction between paid and volunteer uh, fort services, and especially where they coexist. Let me ask you a question. In, in, in your experience, what, what has been the impact on volunteer firefighters when the paid service has a monopoly union contract? Well, it's kind of tragic that the union continues, the IFF continues to diminish volunteers. And in fact, they just had one of their conventions where they codified the language that they can actually bring up firefighters, union firefighters, who choose to volunteer for their community up on charges. It's, it's really disingenuous. And you talked about what firefighters do. You know, firefighters go out every day and there's not a firefighter that I don't know that wouldn't make their wife or widow and their kids parentless for the community they serve. So I have the highest respect for firefighters. But ironically, when it comes to line of duty deaths and injuries, the IFF, the International Fire Union, you know, they'll quote the volunteer statistics right along with their brother firefighters. And a tremendous amount of career firefighters like myself started off as volunteers. That was our foundation. So we always wanna give back to the community to provide training. And what we see 
in a lot of communities is, and I used to live in a firehouse when going to college in Montgomery County, Maryland, right across from the Potomac. And the volunteers that were career, they usually were qualified as drivers quicker because they did it as a career because it's hard to get that qualification to operate the pump or operate the aerial ladder. So that's the bread and butter to get out that volunteer piece so it's able to respond to your home. And the career firefighters used to give a lot of flack and threaten charges to what they call, they got a derogatory name for it. They call them two hatters. And they put a lot of pressure to get paid individuals that want to volunteer in their communities to not volunteer. And it's really, really tragic. Now, with the Janus decision, I was a little hopeful because now the career firefighter can tell the union, you know, hey, sorry about your bad luck. I'm just not going to be a union member anymore. The problem is, is that we see across the country where the union leadership writes it into the collective bargaining agreement. So as the process goes on, it may not be the first contract, it may be the second or third one, you'll see language creep in that says that career members can't volunteer or they'll bring them up on charges. And one of the other things we see is you get a collective bargaining agreement in place and there's a relationship between say the county executive and the union president who gives them their word, hey, we're not going to come after the members that volunteer. The problem is, is changing tides. Most union presidents term is only two to four years. So that individual may be good on their word, but that member loses an election, or now all of a sudden you have another administration come in. Now you have that issue to the forefront. So I always go back to when I lived in the firehouse in Montgomery County, Maryland, one of the guys would come in and he was from Detroit, Michigan, and they would give him a hard time. And one day he just lost it. And he's like, I come from Michigan and I see foreign cars in the parking lot. I got one of you guys that's a part-time carpenter, non-union, one guy's a part-time electrician. Other people work for private ambulance companies, but the only ones the unions come after are the union members that volunteer to help their communities. And that was the foundation of America. I fought against it when I was a union president and I continue to fight against it to this day because they should be allowed to volunteer. It's actually a shame that the International Association of Firefighters hasn't taken a stand to get rid of this, but it's there. And the tactics they use against management sometimes are the tactics they use against their own members. And that's really shameful. Uh, and, and help me out, even if it's not in the collective bargaining agreement, the, the reality is that union leadership, at least it was my experience, union leadership has a pretty fair amount of influence over your assignments uh, and over your duty stations. And so, you know, they can go after you, but it, it doesn't need to be that obvious. They just give you the worst assignments repeatedly over and over again until you why is that? I mean, maybe, am I inaccurate here or is that possible? No, it could pressure, policy pressure comes from all angles. It could be as informal as you're talking about, or it could be as formal as actually bringing you up in charges. If you look at the bylaws for the international, you know, embezzlement and fraud is right up there. A couple of paragraphs down is volunteering to help your community. Uh, it's it's absurd. You know, the government shouldn't pick your pocket or break your leg, as Jefferson said. But the union wants to do that and they want government to be a partner in saying you can't volunteer and it's wrong. So, so quite literally, theoretically, I mean, you, you could be a, uh, uh, a person who lives in a small town in, let's say, Orange County, Virginia, um, volunteering in your local volunteer. And I don't even know if they have one, but volunteering in a local volunteer crossing the county, maybe traveling 50 or 60 or 70 miles because you're going to stay there for, for three days for your shift and, and be a paid firefighter in a place like Prince William or Fairfax County. And they theoretically could stop you from protecting your hometown in Orange. Absolutely. I just had a firefighter stop at my house and he's a volunteer chief in a town that has no career department, but he's also a career firefighter in another jurisdiction he got stuck on a, an alarm. He asked somebody to cover. He ended up getting to work on time. 
And lo and behold, when he opened up the cabinets, it said volunteer scab and amongst other things I won't say on a webinar. So that's that informal pressure that's there that there's no place for that in the workplace. Right. Yeah. I, it's astonishing. Uh, Vinny, in cities like New York and Chicago, we're always hearing about how um, uh, union bar unions bargain not only for wages, but for benefits and working conditions. Some of that's driven up the pensions and health care costs and made it difficult for poor performing employees to be held accountable. What are the kind of things that can be bargained for, can't be bargained for? And I mean, is, is there anything that's off the table in Virginia or is that all need to be set out in the in in the uh, uh, in the ordinance? Uh, Virginia is actually quite different than um, even Illinois or New York, like you're talking about in that um, the collective bargaining ordinance SB 939 that passed last year and went into effect on May 1st, um, it, it really didn't describe anything or give any guardrails um, or lanes of what collective bargaining for public employees is in Virginia. Now, there are some state laws like the Secret Ballot Protection Act, um, like a uh, few things uh, for teachers or for educators, but for the most part, right now, it's the wild, wild west. I mean, those other states that have collective bargaining, they have entire sections of code dedicated to this is what you can bargain over. This is what you can't bargain over. Um, this is what unions can do. This is what they can't do. This is what management can and can't do, et cetera, et cetera. And literally, those take up entire sections of code in some states. Going back to what Frank was talking about, the Virginia code is basically like this. It's a paragraph. It says that localities, if uh, a majority of employees petition, they got to vote. And then if they vote to allow an ordinance, they have to have a way to form a union and a way to remove a union. And oh, by the way, strikes are illegal. Besides that, it is wide open for what localities can do. And frankly, it's not just wide open for the type of ordinances. And this is why you're seeing so many different ones around the state. But um, unlike those states that have one centralized labor board, each individual locality has to create their own labor administrator or labor board or whatever they want to call it. And we're seeing massive costs associated with that. For instance, Prince William is estimating $2 million just to bargain with police and fire. Now, once again, this is not benefits. This is not wages. This is not training or anything that's actually going to the public employees or services for the taxpayer. This is just attorneys and bureaucrats to administer the process of bargaining. Fairfax is um, estimating 1.6 million in those administrative costs. Loudoun, a million. City of Alexandria, about a million. And the list can go on and on. And once again, these are millions and millions of dollars per locality, in some cases, smaller localities, just to hire attorneys, just to get bureaucrats simply to administer the process. It's cost that, frankly, that money should be going to public employees. Maybe it should be going to better benefits or wages, more services for taxpayers, or lo and behold, maybe even tax cuts for residents. But instead, if they pass collective bargaining, it's going to be going for those administrative costs. Let me, um, you know, one of the things, I mean, people talk about the collective bargaining issue, uh, the monopoly union agreement contracts, and that, that really is the heart of it to me. I've contended from the beginning that this whole debate is really about building union resources in the state in order to get repeal of right to work. And we've now started to see uh, the head of uh, uh, the Appropriations Committee in the House of Delegates, if he's returned, has made that a priority for himself. Uh, we've seen um, uh, one of the statewide candidates, and we're nonpartisan, so I won't mention who he is, um, but say that you know he, he, he's rethinking that issue. Um, politics is a consideration, and both of you have alluded to, I think, Frank, more than others, one of the big differences between public employee unions and private unions is that public employee unions negotiate with politicians. And, and I, when I said I was a member of the CSEA when I lived in New York, the union spent huge sums of money and manpower on behalf of incumbent elected officials 
because it rewarded the people who were going to be deciding on their salary, benefits, and working conditions. How does that play out? How did it play out in, in Connecticut? How does it play out in other places where you've worked? What have you heard about that? And let's, let's start. I want to ask both of you that question. So let's start with Frank. Okay, just to take it back a second. So when we're talking about wages, hours, and working conditions, there's nothing to prevent the politicians now without collective bargaining to increase those things or to have the union that's there as an association now to lobby for those things. Collective bargaining essentially puts in a process. It puts in a hammer. So it's not the kumbaya advocacy that you may have right now. It's about force and it's about pressure. Um, politics, it's, it's kind of strange because most individuals out there think that politics they're negotiating every single thing with the politician. And that's just simply not true. Where we see politics come into play with union contracts is it's usually over one to three issues. Now, sometimes those are significant issues that have huge implications on the taxpayers. But the mayor of a city and the county executive, they're not sitting down with the union negotiating a contract. The union and the labor director of human resources are doing that. There's a process for that. And the union's just much better prepared for that process to beat them up over the course of the year. Management always seems to be outgunned. That's one of the things at Yankee Institute that we're doing differently is we actually put forth a program on management strategies to train labor directors, department heads, managers, um, elected officials on how to negotiate with the union. So politics plays a critical role for those significant issues, but individuals have to realize it's not just all politics. I've seen, now Yankee, we're bipartisan. I worked in a city where there was no such thing as a Republican. So I can only talk about Democrats. So in my 22 years there, there was some Democrats that were really tough on the unions that knew how to negotiate that kept the taxpayers in mind. They were fair to the employees, but they kept the taxpayers in mind. And then there was others that had no clue what they were doing. So it's a Republican thing and a Democratic thing that they're not prepared to negotiate against the unions. And yes, they put so much money into politics and goes back to the saying, if, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and they use politics as a hammer to get around the manager. So as soon as the manager says no, the union goes right around them to the board member. And even if they can't get the board member to, to make a decision, sometimes they can get that board member, that state legislator to make a phone call, to put pressure on that manager. It, it basically makes the union an equal boss. And you know, I want to get to you on that question too, but let me just follow up, Frank, with something you said. Um, you talked about, about the union negotiators being much better prepared than the city negotiators. How much better do you think they'll be prepared here in Virginia when the cities and the counties have never had to negotiate before? And, and frankly, if, if, I'm, if I'm a county executive or a county administrator, um, you know, how, do I, how do I bring myself up to speed on this? What do I do? Well, to take the first part of your question... If the union's been pushing for this collective bargaining language at the state legislature, I could pretty much guarantee that they started working on contract negotiations before they even put that proposal forward. So just take normal contract negotiations. A lot of times you'll hear the union say, oh, you know, it's we renegotiate every four years or every three years. And that's where the focus is. No, the unions negotiate every single day. It's about grabbing as much as you can, grabbing that power every single day, putting forth the best position that you can. Financial, they're not thinking about the taxpayers. They're not thinking about the kids. They're only thinking about the bottom line that they can bring to the membership. So they have stable of witnesses. Virginia, guarantee. They've already looked around to say, if arbitration is part of that policy, who can we have to testify. A lot of cities will bring in a human resources person to testify or somebody from the medical insurance company. The union's bringing in hired guns, you know, people that have resumes like Vinny, people who are in public policy. They are ready to go. And here's the thing. 
if you're a manager, if you're a department head or human resources, you're dealing with multiple contracts. You're also dealing with budgets, programs, operations, delivering service to the community. The union's singularly focused. The only thing they're focused on, they wake up in the morning, they go to bed at night. They're thinking about how can I get more at the bargaining table? How can I grab more power? And a lot of times they do it in such a way that the politicians don't even realize that the union's negotiating. A lot of times it's like simple, well, before you can do X, you have to meet with us. And the union does it in such a friendly way. What they're doing is they're creating process. So when management fails to meet with them on that one time, then they file a charge. Then they build in more process with the settlement and it just grows and grows and grows. Collective bargaining is has to have more focus than even the budget and program. You got to have a department head that knows how to negotiate against the unions to also know when the unions negotiating against them. And that's why Yankee Institute developed that program to kind of help move things in a different direction. And we're at the infantile stage. And I'm pleased to announce that the city of Houston just reached out and we're going to be training some of their department heads there. But the unions just are playing chess all the time and management's playing checkers. There's, there's no other way I can put it. And if I could say one thing, I don't want to be too long winded. What happens is because the elected leaders tend not to come from that union background, the two things they try to complain about the most on management side is legal fees and the number of proposals. So think about it like this. You have a union that's ready to go to war. Legal fees, they got a war chest. They're ready to go. And then you have people that are conservative thinking they're helping the taxpayers saying, well, we need to cap these legal fees. So now the union's already got a leg up. Then they go, let's cap proposals because they don't understand how negotiations work. So picture this, you start off playing a game of chess or a game of checkers, and you start off with half of your pieces missing. And that's <laughs> what a lot of people who are more conservative who are concerned about the taxpayers. That's like their fallback position because they haven't been educated in how negotiations actually work. You don't ever want to limit legal fees, and you don't want to limit the number of proposals, you need to create that win-win at the bargaining table so that the taxpayers would have a voice. You have to remember, Chris and Benny, that every collective bargaining agreement that's negotiated out, out there is negotiated in the name of the taxpayers, and they deserve a voice. You said something interesting. I just want to ask, so the Yankee program is not just for Connecticut? You're, you're, you're moving out of state on this? Um, we're trying to help anybody who wants help. So Carol Platt Lebow, our president, she's fantastic. And she's always puts the mission first while we're focused in on Connecticut. When Vinny reached out for this, I was, you know, first I was honored to be a part of a, a great institution like Thomas Jefferson to bring this and work with Yankee and Thomas Jefferson. But, you know, we're all in this together. Well, we're honored to have you with us. Vinny, let me get back to the politics of it. What, what, what do what kind of experiences have you seen around the country? Well, we saw a recent study um, by the National Institute for Labor Relations Research, and um, they estimate um, that unions spent $1.8 billion during the last election cycle. I mean, that's a lot of money. Now, all of that wasn't to candidate politics, but without getting into, you know, what party, where, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that um, for candidate giving, about 90% give or take of union giving goes to one party. But what's really interesting is survey after survey have shown that 40% of those represented by a union actually um, vote for the other party. So in a lot of sense, with these political giving, they're not representing even their own membership. Um, and then you also see some of the things that unions lobby for. Uh, you see example of, for example, of unions lobbying for, let's say, higher taxes. And then there's a whole host of other things where I, I probably won't get into exactly what they're lobbying for, but um, there's a lot of things that may not reflect the value of both their members and um, di different parts of Virginia. Um, but let's go back to right to work, though. And, um, it, you know, you brought up that there's definitely a concerted effort attack on right to work. Um, and it is something that um, we should be focusing on right now. 
Now, right to work, you know, just to define the issue real quick, um, it simply means that a union can't get a private sector worker fired for not paying them. Public sector is already taken care of by the Janus decision. Thankfully, um, we can't do anything to take away the ability of um, public employees to choose whether or not to pay union dues, even if one of these ordinances passed. But for the private sector, right to work means that they have a choice of whether or not they say, yeah, this union's doing a good job, we wanna pay the union, or no, it's not, and we wanna keep our hard earned paycheck. If right to work is repealed, the union can actually go to that private sector workers employer and say, no, 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 that employee has to pay us. And if they don't pay us, if they don't give us union fees, then they can't work here anymore. That's what right to work means. It also shows right to work states around the country also have better economic growth. They have lower unemployment. They have more jobs and um, workers. When you factor in cost of living, they're actually making more and they actually see higher wage growth after right to work passes. Um, but when it comes to union politics, yeah, it, it is something that we are going to see. And unfortunately, unions do spend money on things that I think, you know, even a lot of their members disagree with. Well, and, and those union fees, those union dues can be pretty substantial uh, in some industries, $1,200, $1,500 a year. Is that my recollection? That's great. But they, they can be up to that much. I think the average uh, dues in Virginia is about five to $600. Some unions um, obviously have higher dues than others. Um, and then, you know, with public sector, the data really isn't out there. Um, it's a little harder to find that. But you could see, obviously, some of those where dues are a little bit more expensive than some of the other ones. Right, let me remind everyone that if you do have any questions, please put it in the chat room. I'm going to I'm going to step off the, the collective bargaining issue for a second because you've, you've emphasized right to work. Uh, the PRO Act, which is up in the in the U.S. Senate, fundamentally would repeal all the state's right to work laws. And my understanding, my recollection, and I'm assuming he's still holding firm that uh, Virginia Senator Mark Warner is still holding firm that he's not going to support it the way it is currently written. Is that, is that okay? Have you got an update on that by any chance? Uh, I mean, there's been some rumors about Senator Warner back and forth, but right now uh, the PRO Act is, um, is still on the table. It's been passed out of the House. Um, it's still waiting in the Senate. They still have to... Um, not just get to 50 in the Senate, but they have to either abolish the filibuster, which that does not look like it's going to happen, at least right now, um, or get to 60 in the Senate to pass the PRO Act. And Chris, you're exactly right. The PRO Act would abolish right to work across the country, for private sector workers across the country, including here in Virginia. But it would even go further than that. It would um, destroy the franchising industry. It would make uh, people that own their own business uh, it would make them managers. So somebody that's making $200,000 a year owning their own business become a $50,000 manager because of the attacks of the PRO Act on the franchise industry. Independent contracting would be next to impossible because of the standards that the PRO Act puts forth. Um, people cannot work for themselves as easily as they do today. And you know, I, I won't go through all of it. There's many more provisions in the PRO Act. It is essentially the smorgasbord of bad ideas. It doesn't look like um, it's moving right now. Unfortunately, we are seeing provisions of the PRO Act in the reconciliation package that's going through Congress right now. Um, and uh, we also expect, unfortunately, the Biden administration to try to do a lot of it regulatorily as well. Uh, so definitely um, a lot to watch out for. And in some of these provisions are provisions that were rejected by the California voters uh, last year. I mean, it was too liberal for California, uh, but Congress, the Senate, Congress or House already has pushed it through. And I guess the Senate is thinking about it. Um, Frank, let me ask you, you hear this question about positioning during contract negotiations. What, is, what does that mean what, for, the, for the ordinary person? What does that mean? Or, or for the negotiator on the city side, what does that mean? Well, we hit upon it a little bit earlier, Chris, but it's basically that singular focus on the collective bargaining agreement. It's about the stable of witnesses. It's about putting together contract language that's favorable. When something happens in Virginia, something happens in Connecticut, that language is shared because that's their only focus. When you have managers 
that get together, take a police chief, goes out and meets another police chief at a conference. They're not talking about contract language. They're talking about crime stuff. So the union automatically has that leg up. And they do things to uh, position against the taxpayers. For example, everybody's for transparency. So whether you have a Sunshine Law or Freedom of Information Act, unions and management, when they execute agreement, sometimes that agreement's called a memorandum of understanding, where the union grabs a little bit more power. But then when the citizens start FOIN or through the Freedom of Information asking for memorandums of understanding, you'll see the unions all of a sudden start naming the same exact agreements. A stipulated agreement will say at the top, it's the same thing or a settlement agreement. So then when it's FOI, it doesn't come up in FOI. So one of the things for transparency for Virginia and elsewhere is because these agreements are done in the name of the taxpayers, anytime there is an executed agreement, in other words, a binding signature, which is usually from the union president and whoever the binding signature is from the city, it's usually the human resources director or <clears throat> the labor director, those documents should be posted online along with the union contract, probably within 72 hours or the next close of business, because that's where they hide a lot of those stuff is in those MOUs. So you can read the contract and not even know what's in the contract because of settlement agreements, stipulated agreements, MOUs. The union is always working to get more. We are coming up on on certainly the end of the time we allocated for this, and and I'll just yeah, again offer to make an answer, offer to post any questions. But I did want to give both of you an opportunity to kind of sum up uh, the points you wanted to make. Yeah, we are incredibly grateful, Frank, for you for you participating in this. Um, I have said it from the beginning; they don't know what's about to hit them in some of these cities, and some of the counties. Uh, I'm afraid of. The elected officials, A, do believe it's going to be a nice collaborative agreement, and B, they're they're just helping out the people that helped them get elected in the first place. So um, I guess that was sort of a favor. So let me ask you about favors. You, you find that kind of thing going on in, on, in this uh, world? Well, when it comes to labor management, it's, it's okay to do a favor for somebody, but you never want to ask them to do a favor for you because the whole mindset of negotiations is you want to create a obligation on the other side. And that favor is going to come due at the most, at the time that you don't want it to come due. And they know how to push favors. I was in a bar one night and there was a hell's angel there. And my friend asked him, what can get you killed as a hell's angel? And he looked at him and he said, the only thing that could get you killed quicker than a bullet is a favor. And he meant by owing a favor. And what you have to watch for, because I used to do it all the time, is the unions will do everything they can to create an obligation, even when it's not there. So if management was going back and forth with me and I was giving in to something that they were going to get anyway, I'd be like, yeah, I'm willing to do you a favor this time because I want to obligate them. And a lot of managers, they just keep, they don't even know, but, but when they're in a room with a bunch of people, now I'm going to come back and say, well, remember the time I did that big favor for you because you needed this and I'll run down the thing. I make everybody uncomfortable. So favors are important. It's a, it's a negotiating tool that the unions use against management. And all too often, the union will claim a favor when one doesn't exist. And the manager needs to know to stop it because it'll come back when there's a room full of people and it'll embarrass the manager, even though the manager did nothing wrong. I think I think I used to hear it referred to back in New York as deposits in the bank. Um, it was the bank of favors that that you had negotiated. We have a question from the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance, at least uh, I think the president of it. Uh, in Fairfax County, unions already make huge campaign contributions and campaign for candidates. What's going to change with collective bargaining? And I'll leave that to, to both of you, frankly, if you have different thoughts on it. No, well, I mean, the question of the political, yes, they already um, do those political contributions. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when it comes to politics. Um, but what I want to focus on is the what's going to happen to the individual employees. Once again, 
by a collective bargaining agreement, they could be trapped into paying union dues. They could um, be uh, they could be forced to have money taken from their paycheck because of that. Um, they also could be trapped into a union that they don't want that would have the ability to represent them. Remember, what we're talking about with collective bargaining is giving unions that monopoly, that exclusive representation to represent all employees. So the biggest thing that's going to happen is that the union will have a monopoly, that individual employee that could go to their employer will no longer be able to have that ability. At the very least, the union will have to be present. More likely than not, they'll have to go through the union and they'll have to accept whatever the union negotiates for them. Now, uh, Fairfax is now in the middle of drafting their ordinances. I know they're still debating it, but essentially they've said the sky is the limit of what can be bargained over, uh, wages, benefits, no limit there, even working condition, even management rights, um, the ability to do schedules, the ability to do layoffs, the ability to do discipline, all of that is on the table. Um, they don't have to bargain over it, but the way the ordinance is written is that if they pressure the employer to bargain over it, the employer could give in and give a lot of power to the unions to negotiate those things, even in states of emergency. Before emergencies were off the table, now it's well if it's anticipated in the collective bargaining agreement, you have to abide by the collective bargaining agreement. And even if it's not, you have to negotiate with us as soon as you can. Um, so a lot's going to change and it's going to give a lot more power to the unions. You mentioned Fairfax County and, and last we had checked, we, I think it was anticipated that there would be a public hearing on October 5th. Um, I think that there was going to be a decision made today on, on the exact date, but not just Fairfax County, but any county. What, what can a citizen do about this to sort of call this to the attention of their local official? It's sort of lobbying 101, but you want to talk about that just a bit? Some of the points that they might want to make? Well, I mean, you know, we are a C3, so we're not going to get into too much of, um, you know, what to do. But, um, you know, definitely they need to make their voices heard. And they have to say, you know, this will harm us and talk about what, uh, what collective bargaining will do. Um, if collective bargaining has to be passed, Chris, I'll, uh, I'll plug a Thomas Jefferson study uh, real quick that uh, obviously I, I helped uh, draft. But uh, Thomas Jefferson actually has a toolkit of if um, elected officials are going to pass collective bargaining, what's the best way to do it? What should be in there? What are model ordinances? And um, that's on Thomas Jefferson's website. I'm sure we can send it around. And uh, Frank, it actually goes through uh, transparency and makes a lot of those recommendations that you were just talking about to make sure even if there are those mem memorandums of understanding, there are those um, collective bargaining agreements, that has to be open to the public. If there's contract negotiations, that has to be open to the public. Um, even um, agreements while they're being made, that has to be made public because once again, you're talking about taxpayer dollars and you're talking about public policy. Um, we, I just got a, a post that uh, uh, Fairfax County actually set up a, an email specifically for comments on the collective bargaining idea. Um, and the email address for anybody who wants it is uh, collective bargaining, one word, collective bargaining at fairfaxcounty.gov. Um, and the, the note I have here is that this is the official county email for collective bargaining. And so far, they've received only messages in favor of it. So if you have strong views in, in another term, this is the time to do it. Um, if you email us, uh, and I will email everyone on this call again to offer it. Uh, we're happy to share and send you that, that uh, monograph that Vinny did that is just so good, particularly in a state like Virginia where no one knows what this is. Um, and uh, we'll send you some more information as well. Frank, let me ask you, uh, you, get, you get the last word. Um, you care to sum up for us? Yeah, just to go back to that last question that you asked, the change, if you get collective bargaining, more and more money is going to come in and they're going to be encouraging their, mon their members to establish PACs. You're going to see more money coming into politics. And one of the, the perversions of labor that is very disheartening across the board is most people, regardless of where you stand politically, understand workers advocating for wages, hours, and working conditions. 
But the perversion comes in the fact that this money that comes into politics will be advocating for everything other than wages, hours, and working conditions. They weigh in on everything now, and it's the union member that gets left by the side of the road because here their dues dollars that they thought when they paid was going to be going to actually represent them. It's really not. It's going to put forth a political agenda that has nothing to do with work. We just had another question pop up, and I'll leave it up to you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the answer. What's the average cost of collective bargaining? In terms of direct and indirect labor costs, could it be as much as 1% of payroll? I suspect actually it, it may be even higher than that, uh, particularly in Virginia, because for starters, they have to make up the union dues they'll now be collecting um, and for the, for the employee. Uh, but the other is that uh, Virginia employee, public employees tend to have uh, better benefits than private sector employees, but, but aren't necessarily paid as much. So uh, one figure showed that it would probably go up four or five percent in Virginia. But Frank, um, that's what you said about that the private sector and public sector, at least for Connecticut, they're not paid as much, but public sector workers get better benefits. Uh, Yankee Institute did a study and they found that the pay is almost comparable within like a thousand to two thousand dollars a year, but public sector workers get 28 percent more in benefits it's it's so it's a significant amount of money i'll serve a softball up for Vinny because i'm not a budget guy but i can say as a union boss was when it came to how much it cost i try to run up the bill as much as possible if i was going in negotiations i'm preparing for 300 proposals because i want to drag it out so i can put pressure to get the best possible deal. So Vinny, um, you could go ahead with the actual numbers if you have. Sure, them. Uh, I'll just close. Um, I won't give a number, but I will say that you look at those administrative costs and that's where I'm focusing. You know, a lot of that money should be spent on either services, better benefits or wages for public employees or tax cuts for taxpayers. And what we're seeing is that, you know, aside from payroll, aside from benefits, there's a lot of money that's gonna be spent just to administer the process. Well, thank you. Thank both of you very much for participating in this. Frank, taking time out of your schedule from beautiful Connecticut right now, which is where you are. Um, I appreciate it very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, no one in Virginia knows what collective bargaining truly is. And, and I would suggest that we are in for some rocky times ahead if your locality approves it. Um, at the end of the day, you're the ones who have to track it, you're the ones who have to watch it, and you're the ones who have to speak out because you're the ones in your district that elected officials are going to listen to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Vinny. And thank all of you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night.